filthy dreamers that defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Jude, verse 8. William Jenkin, 1652. Here Jude sets down the second part of the second argument, which he brought to incite these Christians earnestly to contend for the faith opposed by the seducers. The argument was taken from their certain destruction, and a managing of which, having first mentioned a number of examples of God's judgment upon the offenders of former times, he now in the second place adds that these seducers lived in those sins which God had punished in others, and this he prosecutes in the eighth, ninth, and tenth verses. In the eighth verse, two parts are considerable. First, the faults with which these seducers are charged, the fountain from which these faults issued. For the first, the faults, we may consider their specification and their amplification. Their specification, defiling of the flesh. Secondly, opposing of authority, set down by the apostle here in two branches. Their despising of dominion inwardly. Their speaking evil of dignities outwardly. Number two, their amplification in these two words. Likewise, also. They send both as the former sinners had offended, and although they knew they were punished. Secondly, the fountain from which these their faults issued, namely their spiritual security and delusion, both contained in the word dreamers. Observation 1. Sins of carnal uncleanness are peculiarly against the body or flesh of men. In many, not all other heinous sins, the thing abused is without the body, as in murder, theft, and so on. But in this, the body itself is abused, 1 Corinthians 6.18. The body not only concurs, but suffers by this sin more than any other, both by dishonor and diseases. Dishonor, in the staining and defiling that noble piece of workmanship curiously wrought by the finger of God himself, by diseases, this lust being not only a conscience-wasting, but a carcass-wasting enemy. Central men kill that which they pretend most to gratify. Wherein are the enslaved to this lust wiser than Samson in his discovering to Delilah where his strength lay? Though that impudent harlot plainly told him she desired to know it, to afflict him. I have heard of a drunkard that said, having almost lost his sight by immoderate drinking, he had rather lose his eyes than his drunkenness. And of an old adulterer who was so wedded to and yet so weakened by his lust that he could neither live with or without his unclean companion. Were not these slaves? Truly such sinners are no better than the devil's hack knives, meeting with nothing but stripes and drudgery. And when they can do no more, the filthiest ditch, even hell itself, is their receptacle. Our bodies never cost Satan anything, and he, like the harlot who was not the mother of the child, pleads indeed vehemently to have them for his own. But Yothal cares not if they are cut in pieces. The worshippers of Baal slashed their poor carcasses for a god that was not able to hear them. Idolaters have not thought their own dear children themselves repeated sacrifices too dear for Moloch. How do papists tear and macerate their bodies in their will worship? Among them, those who want to suspend and reports for 33 days together went up and down slashing their carcasses with whips till they had almost whipped themselves to death. They expressed more madness and mortification. Superstition neglects and punishes the body, Colossians 2.23. How different from these, how gentle and indulgent even to the poor body are the services of God. 
He calls for honorable services and merciful sacrifices, nay, mercy and not sacrifice. Chastity, temperance, and so on are severe only to those lusts which are cruel to us. Even fasting itself, which seems one of the sorest services, furthers the health of the body. God might, and yet mercifully too, have appointed, since the body is such an enemy to the soul, that like medicines given to those that are troubled with contrary diseases, the services which are beneficial to the one should have been hurtful to the other. But so meek and indulgent a master as the Lord is, that his commands are profitable to both. Observation 2. Sins of unchastity are peculiarly defiling. Besides that spiritual uncleanness in which every sin defiles, carnal and chastity defiles with that which is bodily. All sin in general is called uncleanness, but fornication is a sin which is singled out particularly to be branded with that name. Some think that adulterers are especially compared to dogs, unclean creatures. The hire of a whore and the price of a dog are put together and both forbidden to be brought into the house of the Lord, Deuteronomy 23, verse 18. And when Abner was by Ashbisheth, reproved for defiling Rispa, he answers, Am I a dog? The child begotten in adultery is, Deuteronomy 23, 2, called Mamzer, which some learned men derive from two words, signifying another man's spot or defilement. How foolish are they who desire to have their dead bodies embalmed and their living bodies defiled. There is a peculiar opposition between fornication and sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 The saints of God should have a peculiar abhorrence of this sin fornication and uncleanness and so on let it not be once named among you as become saints ephesians 5 3 they should cleanse themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit second corinthians 7 1 a man who is of a cleanly disposition loves to wear clean garments the body is a garment of the soul and a clean heart will preserve a pure body remember christians by what hand your bodies were made by what guests they are inhabited, to what head they are united, by what price they are purchased, and what laver they have been washed, and to whose eye they shall hereafter be presented. Consider lastly whether Delilah's lap be a fit place for those who expect a room in Abraham's bosom. Observation 3. The love of lust makes men erroneous and seducers. They who make no conscience of ordering their conversation will soon be heretical. These seducers who opposed the faith were unclean and flesh defilers. The fool said in his heart that there was no God, and the true ground of it immediately follows. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. Psalm 14, verse 1. They who put away a good conscience concerning faith will soon make shipwreck. 1 Timothy 1.19 The lust of ambition and desire to be teachers of the law makes men turn aside to vain jangling. 1 Timothy 1.7 Diatrophus, love of preeminence, puts him upon opposing the truth. 3 John 10 The lust of covetousness did the like. They who supposed that gain was godliness quickly grew destitute of the truth, 1 Timothy 6, 5. While some coveted money, they erred from the faith, 1 Timothy 6, 10, Micah 3, 5. They who subverted whole houses and taught things which they ought not did it for filthy lucre's sake, Titus 1, 11. The blind watchmen and the shepherds which understood not were such as could never have enough and looked every one for his gain, and they were dumb because they were greedy dogs. Isaiah fifty six ten and eleven. The lust of voluptuousness produced the same effect. They who caused divisions contrary to the doctrine which the Romans had learned were such as served their own belly, 
Romans 16:17. They who led captive silly women laden with divers lusts resisted the truth, were men of corrupt minds and reprobate concerning the faith. 2 Timothy 3. Wine and strong drink made the prophets err and go out of the way. The heretics of old, the Gnostics, Basilidians, Nicolaitans, and so on, were so infamous for carnal uncleanness as Epiphanius. Augustine and others report that a modest ear would even suffer by the relation of it. Nor have the Papists and Anabaptists of late come far short of them. The lusts make the affections to be judges, and where affection sways, judgment decays. Hence Aphonsus advised that affection should be left at the threshold when any went to counsel. We are prone to believe that to be right and lawful, which we would have to be so. Lusts oppose all entrance of light which opposes them. Repentance alone makes men acknowledge the truth. 2 Timothy 2.25 How can you believe, saith Christ, who receive honor one from another? Central men taught that the resurrection was past because it troubled them to think of it. 2 Timothy 2.18 The consideration of a resurrection, a hell, a heaven, disturbs them, and therefore they deny these. If the light be too much in men's eyes, they will either shut their eyes or draw the curtains. Lusts will pervert the light which is brought in, making men, instead of bringing their crooked lives to the straight rule, to bring the straight rule to the crooked lives, and instead of bringing their hearts to the scripture, to bring the scripture to their hearts. Hence it is that wicked men study the scripture for distinctions, to maintain their lusts, and truly a carnal will is often helped by Satan to a carnal wit. Lastly, God in judgment gives up such who will not see to an inability and utter impotency to discern what they ought and to a reprobate mind. They who will not be scholars of truth are by God justly delivered up to be masters of error. And because men will not endure sound doctrine, God allows them to heap to themselves teachers after their own lust to turn away their ears from the truth, and to be turned unto fables. Because that when the very heathen extinguished the light of nature, and knowing God did not glorify him as God, professing themselves wise, they became fools, and God gave them up to uncleanness and vile affections. Much more may God send those who live under the gospel, and don't receive the love of the truth, Strong delusions that they should believe lies. Second Thessalonians two ten and eleven. Wonder not, therefore, at that apostasy from the truth which abounds in these days, and the opposing of those old precious doctrines which heretofore men have embraced in appearance. Some unmortified lust or other there was in them, some worm or other of pride, licentiousness, and so on. And these beautiful apples, which made them fall from the tree of truth to the dirt of error, instead, therefore, of being scandalized at them, let us be careful of ourselves. If we would hold the mystery of faith, let us put it into a pure conscience. Let us keep no lust in delicious. Love we no sin, if we would leave no truth. Let us love what we know, and then we shall know what to love. Let us sincerely do the will of Christ, and then we shall surely know the doctrine of Christ. I understand more than the ancients, saith David, because I keep thy precepts. Psalm 119, 100. The Lord will teach such as way, and guide them in judgment. Evil men, saith Solomon, understand not judgment. But they that seek the Lord understand all things. Proverbs 28.5 If we will turn from our iniquities, we shall understand the truth. Daniel 9.13 Who is wise, and he shall understand these things? Having treated of the first specified fault in which these seducers were charged, namely, their defiling the flesh, 
The second follows. Their contempt of magistracy, and in that first of the branch thereof, namely, they despise dominion inwardly. Three things I here propound by way of explication. First, what we are here to understand by dominion. Secondly, by despising that dominion. Thirdly, upon what ground Jude here condemns them for despising it. In the first, we may consider two things. Number one, to whom this dominion is attributed. Number two, what it is and wherein it consists. The word in the original, dominion, is the same with that mentioned in Second Peter 2.10 and translated government. And though it properly signified lordship, domination or government in the abstract, the power and office of magistracy or any ruling over others, must it necessarily comprehend the persons themselves governing or in a place of authority. Government without governors is but a notion, and were it not for governors, there would be no hating of government. Paul, by higher powers, Romans 13.1, understands both the power or authority itself is also the persons vested with that power and authority. And when Peter commands the Christians to love the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2.17, he intends a whole company of the brethren, as we understand by the nobility of the land, the nobles themselves. And yet here Jude names in the abstract rather dominion and authority itself than those who were placed therein, to show what it was which these seducers opposed and struck at, namely, not as officers so much as at their office, not as magistrates, but at the madras to see. They loved not the same ruling over others and such a difference among men. They aimed at anarchy, as Calvin remarks upon the place. Being proud, they could not endure superiors, and being licentious, they were impatient of restraint. Psalm, by this dominion of which Jude speaks, understand the dominion and authority of the Lord Christ, received from his Father, and so refer this despising of dominion to that sin of ungodliness mentioned in verse 4, where these seducers are said to be ungodly, and to deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They despise dominion. That is, saith Lurinus, Christ himself was not only called Lord in the concrete, but even dominion in the abstract, because of the excellency of his dominion. But though it be true that Satan has ever endeavored to overthrow the domination of Christ by heretics who have denied his natures, sometimes his offices at other times have indeed showed themselves antichrists. 1 John 2, 4. Yet under correction I conceive that the dominion and dignities in which Jude here speaks are to be referred to the civil magistrate. The word Dominion is never attributed to Christ in the New Testament, but always either to angels or magistrates. Ephesians one twenty one, Colossians one sixteen, And it is only agreeable to the scope of this place to interpret it of the magistrate. Even they who by these words understand the dominion of Christ. Yet the, the next words despise dignities are to be understood of magistrates. And the apostle in this verse as is conceived, compares these seducers as for uncleanness to sodomites, so for contempt of government, to the Israelites who rebelled against Moses, most suitably also subjoining the sin to the former of uncleanness, because the love of their lusts and dissoluteness of life made them hate that government which was appointed to restrain them. Number two, for the second what this dominion and power is that is attributed to the magistrate, and wherein it consists, number one. More generally, it stands in superiority, preeminence, and supereminence above others, as is evident by those names by which it is set forth in Scripture as power, authority, rule, and so on. 
Romans 13, 1, 1 Timothy 2, 2, Titus 3, 1. Number two, by those titles which are given to magistrates as kings and such as exercise authority. Luke 22, 25. They that are great, Matthew 20, 25. Rulers, Romans 13, 3. Powers in the abstract, Romans 13, 1. More particularly, this dominion or power consists in three things. In ordaining laws for the good of the subjects. This is called the legislative power. Laws are like the line and plummet of the architect, without which there is no right working. And they are to a commonwealth what the sun is to the earth. Without them, people would not see where to go, what to do. In all places, as is usual in darkness, would be filled with filthiness and violence. They are the cords of the tent, which being cut, it falls to the ground. Laws are the best walls of a city. Without them, even walled cities want defense. There is medicine to the body, both for preventing and removing diseases. Nay, they are as a soul to the body. Without them, the commonwealth would neither have beauty nor be in. Laws have been ever esteemed so necessary that no commonwealth under any form could ever be without them. Nor do these positive laws derogate at all from the perfection of the law moral or of nature, but only discover the deprivation of man's nature in whose hearts, though that work of the law be written, which inclines all to some kind of natural goodness, Yet by the fall is the knowledge of the law of nature so obscured and the force of inordinate affection so prevalent over reason that there is need of positive laws for directing, restraining, encouraging. And indeed positive laws are but rivulets derived and drawn from the law of nature and particular conclusions formed out of its universal principles. The law of nature only in general prescribes what is to be done or avoided, not descending to particulars. Now all, being not able from those general principles to deduce that which is to be practiced in particular cases, which admit of innumerable variations according to circumstances. Positive laws for the good of subjects are necessarily to be suited to the condition of every commonwealth. Nor can it be justly alleged by any that dominion may be committed as well to men alone as to laws. For the law is a voice of God, being a deduction from the law of nature in which a man is a servant of affections, and apt to be biased by hatred, anger, fear, friendship, foolish pity, by reason whereof it is, as a learned man once said, easier for one wise man to make than for many to pronounce law. It was a wise speech of Solon that only that commonwealth could be safe where the people obeyed the magistrate and the magistrates the laws. And of Plato who said, that city cannot be far from ruin where the laws are not above the magistrate, but the magistrate above the laws. And if against this it should be argued that the law must needs be defective, speaks generally, and cannot come up to a number of contingent and special cases and circumstances which it cannot foresee and determine. I answer, let conscientious prudence supply the unavoidable defects, and that we may not set the magistrate and law at variance, that the law having power to hinder the magistrate from transgressing by the force of affection, and let the magistrate have power with rational and religious regard of circumstances to explain and apply the law. Number two of the punishments of the government. There are a number of kinds. Some concern the name as degradation, some the estate. The judges shall make diligent inquisition, and thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Deuteronomy 19, verses 18 and 21. Number two, from his function, he bears not the sword in vain, Roma 13, 4. Governors are for the punishment of evil doers. From the benefit of these punishments, number three, to the punished who may grieve for what they have done, to those who look on, 
who may be warned from doing the same. Proverbs 19.25 Sinful indulgence silently, yet strongly, invites to a second wickedness. Even capital punishments are enjoined by Scripture. Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9.6 Exodus 21.12 a law which being before the erection of the Mosaic polity shows that the laws which afterwards commanded capital punishments did not simply and absolutely, but only in respect to some circumstances, concern the Israelites. The capital punishment of malefactors by the magistrate was dictated by the law of nature, and as the force of the foresaid command was before, so it continued after Moses. Christ himself, even from it, drawing an argument to dissuade Peter from shedding of blood, Matthew twenty six fifty two. Nor do I understand but that, if all punishments of malefactors by the sword be now unlawful, it must necessarily follow that all defending of the subjects by the sword against an invading enemy is unlawful also, the public peace being opposed by the one as much as the other. Nay, may we not argue that if the power of the sword belong not to the magistrate to defend the commonwealth, that it belongs not to any private man to defend himself against the violent assaults of a murderer. To sum up, capital punishments may be inflicted, but sparingly, slowly. It is observed by some that God was longer in destroying Jericho than in making the whole world. As many funerals disgrace a physician, so many executions dishonor a magistrate. The execution of justice should, like thunder, fear many, and hurt few. Let all means be tried before the last be used. A magistrate must not be bloody when he sheds blood. The master bee alone is, they say, without a sting. If a butcher may not be of the jury, much less may he be a judge. Number two, what is to be understood by despising dominion? The word, saith Beza, properly signifies to remove something out of the place, as unworthy any longer to remain therein. And it is in Scripture either spoken of persons or things, when of persons it is declared most fitly by disdain or contempt, as Mark 6.26, Luke 10.16, and it is spoken of things properly which being removed from their place are accounted of no value, effect, or force, as thus it is declared by rejecting Luke 7.30, disannulling Galatians 3.15, casting off 1 Timothy 5.12. And here, because we reject that which we despise, it is rendered despise. Now, these seducers did not reject, disannul, cast off governing, so as to make it cease. That was not in their power, but in their judgment, desires, insinuations, and as much as in them was, they labored to make it accounted void, abrogated, and of no value or force. And their pretense for this practice was a liberty which was by Jesus Christ purchased for them, with which they taught that obedience to magistrates was inconsistent. This seems to be plain by that more general sin which the apostle lays to their charge, of turning the grace of our God into wantonness, verse 4, i.e. the goodness of God in bestowing liberty by Christ into libertinism. And hence it was that these seducers allured their poor seduced followers under the pretense of liberty obtained by Christ, Second Peter 2.18 and 19, to all manner of wickedness and licentiousness of life, bearing them in hand that as they were not now bound to any holiness of life, so particularly that Christ having redeemed them, they were free from all subjection and obedience to others a doctrine which, as it is very taking with flesh and blood, so is it frequently by the apostles Paul and Peter opposed, who grant indeed a liberty in which Christ has made a Christian free, but yet add that this liberty is spiritual, a liberty from the law, sin, death, and hell, Galatians 5.13.
not an immunity from civil obedience, and therefore not to be used for an occasion to the flesh, or for a cloak of maliciousness, 1 Peter 2.16. Nor indeed is anything further from truth in that, because of spiritual liberty, Christians should be free from civil subjection, for as this liberty exempts us not from obedience to the commands of God, for as the Apostle says, Romans six eighteen, being made free from sin, we became servants of righteousness and servants to God. So neither does it exempt from obedience to the magistrate ordained by God. Yea, so far are the godly commands of a magistrate from opposing spiritual liberty, that they rather advance it. For true liberty stands in the choosing of good and the rejecting of evil. And this is furthered by the righteous commands of superiors. Licentiousness is not liberty, but slavery, and makes sinners love their own insensible bondage. Lastly, we shall inquire upon what ground the apostle condemns them for despising dominion. Of this briefly, this is a sin against an ordinance of God. By me kings reign, Proverbs 8.15. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And no magistracy is an ordinance of man in regard of the subject, it being born by man, the object, it being employed about men, the end, also, for the good of men, the kind or sort of it, left to the choice of several nations, yet not in regard of the invention or institution of it, which is only from God. The sin of the seducers was a sin against the welfare and happiness of the public. They, being weary of magistracy, were weary of all the comforts and blessings of peace. And in being desirous to throw down the pillars, they endeavored to pull down the building upon their own and others' heads. What would nations be without government but the dens of wild beasts? Judah and Israel dwelt safely every one under his vine and fig tree all the days of Solomon, 1 Kings 4.25. Even Nebuchadnezzar was a tree under which beasts of the field had shadow, and whose boughs the fowls of the heaven dwelt, and of which all flesh was fed, Daniel 4.12. The funerals of a political parent millions of children will celebrate with tears. Over Saul, who is wicked and tyrannical, does David bid the daughters of Israel to weep, who clothed them in scarlet, 2 Samuel 1.24. Nor was it, according to some, any of the best of kings who is called the breath of our nostrils, Lamentations 4.20. And it is observable when God threatens the taking away of the staff of bread and the stay of water, he adds, as no less a judgment to taking away the judge and the prophet, the prudent and the ancient, and so on, Isaiah 3, 2. By this despising of government, they were in an especial manner their own enemies and sinned against their own happiness. The overturners of lawful magistracy shall find their calamities to arise suddenly. Proverbs twenty four twenty two. He who breaks a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Ecclesiastes ten eight. An evil man seeks only rebellion; therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. It has been observed by some that most, if not all, those whom the Scripture mentions as opposers of magistracy have been punished by violent death, God not vouchsafing them so much as a reprieval to a death bed. Korah and his company, Athaliah, Absalom, Zimri, Joab, Sheba, Adonijah, with many others will prove this, and besides a vast supply which foreign historians afford, how has vengeance pursued all the rebellious mentioned in our English chronicle? Observation 1. How provident is God for man's peace and welfare. Without dominion we should be worse than beasts. It is a breath which so many thousands of creatures draw. Take it away, and none can say, this is mine. If the magistrate were not a god to man, man would soon prove a wolf, nay a devil to man. 
There is no creature which so much lacks a ruler as man. We may say of all other creatures, they are born craft masters. They were apparelled and armed by nature. They are their own cooks, physicians, builders, even at their first entrance. Only man came in without strength, weapon, clothes, or skill. How good is God to provide protectors for him? Violent and bloody men don't fear hell. So much as a halter. Like beasts, they are more afraid of the flash of powder than the bullet. And though their fear of the magistrate saves not their souls, yet many a time has it saved their lives. Without magistracy, robbery would be a law, and men like dogs try all right by their teeth. Where there is no ruler, everyone will be a ruler. He who has no ruler over him will be a tyrant over another. When there was no king in Israel, every Micah had a house of gods, and the Levites went begging judges. 17.6 It is just with God that they should feel the curse of anarchy, who were never thankful for regular dominion. Observation 2 God is highly provoked by sin when he allows magistrates to be burdensome to a people and dominion to be abused, when their deliverers and saviors became their destroyers, and they, like Ephraim, oppressed and broken even in judgment. It was threatened as a sore judgment, I will give children to be their princes and babes to rule over them. For the sins of a people, many and bad are the princes of it. Proverbs 28.2 And God often sets up wicked governors over people, not because they are worthy to rule, but these worthy to be so ruled. God may give a king in his anger. He speaks often of princes who were wolves, ravening to the prey to shed blood. Ezekiel 22.27, Micah 3.1-3, Zephaniah 3.3 3. How righteous was God in making Abimelech a scourge to the Shechemites, who had made themselves a stirrup to his ambition. And undoubtedly, if God may allow the prophets of a people to be fools, and the spiritual men to be mad, to delude and misguide the people, for the multitude of iniquity and a great hatred, Hosea 9, 7, he is not hindered from suffering the princes of people who refuse to be reformed, to be Jeroboam's to their souls, and Rehoboam's to their bodies, pernicious to both. Oh, that people would spend more time in blaming their sins and less in complaining of men, and but sadly and impartially examine their hearts whether the parting with the gospel and ministry would ever fetch a quarter so many complaints from them, as in inconsiderable assessment, or whether sins startle them so much as a tax. And if they find their consciences to give in verdict for God, let them adore his righteous severity. Observation 3. God is much seen in causing men's subjection to magistrates, all natural love to excel in worldly greatness, and like not superiority in others. Every one, saith Calvin on First Peter 5, 5, has in him the mind of a king, that one therefore should keep millions of men in order, restrain, constrain, correct, and command. How could it be but that God himself has imprinted the characters of divinity upon him, and but that there is a divine constitution in a human person? It is you, O Lord, that subduest my people under me, saith David. The stilling, the noise of the seas, the noise of the waves and the tumult of the people are put deservedly together, the latter manifesting the power of God as much as the former. How did David allay the fury of those furious spirits who so eagerly desired to take away the life of Saul? But by this, he is the Lord's anointed. And hence princes should gather when people cast off subjection and despise their dominion, that they themselves has despised God, provoked him to pour contempt upon them, and to make them, for cutting off their lock of loyalty to God, to become even as other men, 
And hence also people should learn to whom to return the praises of their peace and safety, not only to the power and policy of their governors, but principally to the ordination of that God by whom kings reign. Observation 4. The power given by God to magistrates should be improved for the giver. Their dominion should advance that of the chief lord, the greatest kings, or his vassals. The highest earthly powers shall give an account to a higher hereafter, and must therefore be regulated by and serve for promoting a higher for the present. The king is commanded to write him a copy of the law and keep all the words of it. Deuteronomy 17.18 When the crown was put upon the head, the testimony was also put into the hand of Joash. 2 Kings 9.12 The first table of the law should be first in the magistrate's care. Even kings and rulers must kiss the sun. Psalm 2.12 And advance his kingdom and provide that their subjects may not only live under them in peace and honesty, but also in godliness. If this must be the end of the subjects, prayers it must be the end of the magistrate's government. In conclusion, though the power of the magistrate, as such, in the holy things of God is not formal, intrinsical and spiritual, so that he should administer therein, as if Christ had committed the keys to him, Yet it is objective to be employed about ecclesiastical causes, though politically, and to provide for the benefit of the church, and that by removing the impediments of religion, by preserving its maintenance, by convening assemblies for reformation, and so on. Though the magistrate himself exercise not the art of medicine, Yet he takes care that none shall abuse that art, or exercise it hurtfully. 2 Kings 15.14 Observation 5. The enemies of godliness soon become opposers of civil dominion. The apostle had told us that these seducers denied the only Lord God, and here he says they despise dominion. They who don't fear God will not be afraid to speak evil of dignities. The despisers of Saul were the sons of Belial. Good men will not be bad subjects, nor will bad men conscientiously be good subjects. The fear of God is the best foundation of obedience to the magistrate. Remarkable is the order of obedience prescribed by the apostle. Fear God. Honor the king. 1 Peter 2.17 And by Solomon, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king. Proverbs 24.21 Men may, from a principle of policy, forbear opposing magistracy as a danger, but only from a principle of conscience can they abhor it as a sin. The fear of man is but a weak bond, and as easily broken as were the courts by Samson. What a noise do these words leave? Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. In a religious ear, Whatever interest or reputation dictates, the declaration of God's will to a gracious heart is the end of all strife. The discovery that such or such a course is a sin against God in its is enough for a saint. No more disputes then. The threats of a thousand hells are not so dissuasive. Human laws may make men hide. Only God's laws can make men hate disobedience. A mere man is firm and steady in no relations. The great interest of the magistracy is to advance religion. If they provide for the keeping of God's laws, the observation of their own will follow, of course. David discovered himself to be a good man, both in sparing Saul in the cave. Oh, well, it was for Saul that he fell into the hands of a David. And a wise man in setting his eyes upon the faithful of the land and had taken the perfect in their way to serve him. Psalm 101.6 The way for the magistrate to bring men under his subjection is to plant the gospel and to make them subject to Christ. The power of the word and the consciences of people binds more strongly to obedience than the power of the sword over the bodies of the people. And if God always restrains people from rebelling against governors, who shall tolerate in people all sorts of rebellion against God? 
what means that of 1 Samuel 2.30, them that honor me, and so on, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed.